welcome to the Jack Gates Community Forum. I'm your host, Logan Blackman. Our guest today is Mr. Fred Hayes. Mr. Hayes has been a pilot most of his life. He began his career as Marine Corps fighter pilot back in 1954, but he is most famous for his role as an astronaut who flew the Apollo 13 mission. Welcome to Yates, Mr. Hayes. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. Mr. Hayes, you worked at NASA for 20 years and in fact continue in the aerospace industry until your retirement in 1996. So what have you been doing since then? Well, since I uh, retired and moved back here from Florida down by Kennedy Space Center, I've uh, spent a lot of time uh, spoiling grandchildren. Uh, I do uh, fishing. I like to fish. And uh, public speaking events such as this uh, with many schools uh, from you know, elementary up through college level. I'm also uh, doing some professional speaking, uh, mostly conventions, uh, mm -hmm. business meetings, those sorts of things around the country. Now let's talk about the Apollo 13 mission launched April 11, 1970. What was going through your mind during the launch and early phase of Apollo 13? Well the launch uh, it's kind of like if you've been in sports or anybody's uh, be similar to the big game. You've uh, worked and, in our case, trained a very long time, uh, myself through uh, two previous missions. In fact, I was a backup on Apollo 8, and then I backed up Buzz Aldrin on Apollo 11. So it was one of these things you're really ready, you're ready to go. Now, I was had a little damper because we changed out one crewman two days before launch. Uh, Ken Mattingly, who I'd worked with through Apollo 11, a backup crew, uh, was removed from the flight, uh, and Jack Swigert replaced him two days before launch. Uh, but otherwise, you're uh, got butterflies, just like you might start up a big game, and uh, you're very anxious uh, to get on with it. We understand the lunar module had another control called the repressed valve. Why did you feel the need to turn that valve into a type of joke? Uh, well, it wasn't a joke. It actually, it was part of the uh, little short activation procedure I had done uh, uh, down in, while we were down in the lunar module to do this TV show. They, we activated it partially so uh, Mission Control could look at data information that was telemetry down from the vehicle and make sure it was okay. That was the first time they got a chance to look at it, uh, make sure everything had done, had survived during launch. And uh, normally you, and the valve does just turn in the valve, makes this uh, bang, popping noise. And uh, normally you do warn uh, the other people when you're about to turn that uh, valve. Uh, and sometimes I uh, took advantage of uh, not warning the other people, which was a little uh, surprise. Okay. What were your recollections of the oxy oxygen tank explosion? What did you do immediately after the explosion? Uh, the primary reaction uh, was Obviously, surprise, uh, this thing was unexpected. Uh, clearly, I knew it was something uh, abnormal, something very uh, wrong. When I first uh, drifted uh, back up into my normal position, I had been still down in the landing craft, really cleaning up things from that TV show. I was putting mm -hmm. things away. Uh, and got a chance to look at the instrument panel. It was, I, it was great confusion because we had a fairly large, like seven caution and warning lights on. Uh, this is an array of lights, about that big. About half of them are red. Uh, when one of those is on, that generally means something bad. And the other half are kind of an orange, yellow look. Those are called caution lights, which are not normal, but not as bad as the red ones. Well, we had seven of those lights on. We also had a master alarm light on, we had a little blue light called a computer restart light. Uh, this did not uh, describe anything we had ever seen in training. Well, we'd obviously through training, we most of the training was dealing with failures mm -hmm. of one kind or another in these simulations we did. So my initial sense was confusion. Why? What was this? What had happened? And I knew it was something real. Now the ground was uh, Mission Control puzzle with it for about 18 minutes. Well, they didn't think it was real. 
because for the same reason, all these lights, mix of lights and different systems made no sense for any credible failure we had ever uh, thought of. Uh, from there, my feelings went to a great disappointment because in scanning across the instruments, I noted for one of the oxygen tanks that the temperature, pressure, and quantity meters, the needles for one tank, were in the bottom of the gauge, which meant there were different sensors that logically meant one tank was gone, and that was an abort. So I knew right then, within the first minute, we had lost the landing mission. What were some of the key problems and critical decisions that had to be made immediately? Well, the immediate thing was troubleshooting uh, to hopefully figure out we could stop the leak because we still had, we had a second oxygen tank. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, slowly uh, dwindling, but there was hope by a certain isolation shutting down fuel cells and the reactant valves, we could stop the leak. If we had done that, we could have kept the mothership of the command and service module powered up. Uh, not too long down that trail, though, it became apparent we couldn't, we couldn't stop the leak. Uh, and didn't really know why, but we, we, I knew and the command module was eventually going to have to be powered down. So the most important thing then was for Jim Lovell and I to get in the landing craft and get it powered up so we could uh, have communication and still talk to the ground, uh, so we'd have life support for breathing cleansing our air, and uh, control. So we had uh, reaction uh, rocket engines powered up, and a computer uh, powered with a platform that was accurate to point directions in space. Uh, so that was the next uh, most urgent thing, was to get that vehicle powered up. Can you explain to us the debate over doing an immediate direct return trajectory? Abort, I'm sorry, abort are continuing to go around the moon? Uh, well, actually, there was a debate, although we were not, we really were not involved. Uh, I frankly hoped uh, that they would not choose a direct return because of the unknown, the unknown about the damage that had been done, because the only way you could do that was to use the engine on the service module, the command and service module, which was where the oxygen tank had it exploded uh, and, caught, and the damage had incurred. So it was really, we didn't know the status of that uh, system. As it turned out, I, it, it, for various reasons, it was a good decision not to do the direct return. But when we service, uh, separated the service module and one of the views as it tumbled away, it looked like a streak on the engine bell, the thing that protrudes out behind the vehicle and uh, it actually looked maybe like it was dented. Mm. And obviously, if you have damage to that component of a rocket engine, there's a good chance it might have exploded had we tried to use that engine. How concerned, would you, how concerned were you with the elimination of carbon dioxide and the problem with the lithium hydroxide? Uh, that, was, that was an interesting thing. At one point, uh, uh, Jim asked me to, and I did sort of uh, manually with just plain old arithmetic, computed our consumables, and at the time I had us uh, running short of water, I think uh, six hours before entry, mainly for cooling the electronics. And I didn't worry about that because from data before on, on LEMS, Apollo 11's LEM, the last thing Buzz and Neil Armstrong did before they left it was turn off the water valve deliberately see how long it would take electronics mm -hmm. to fail when they left it in lunar orbit. And the first critical component failed at about eight hours. So I said, probably got, we'll probably make it. <laughs> that, that. I never thought of the lithium hydroxide as a consumable. It never occurred to me. And it really wasn't until the meter started rising over time and was called to our attention by mission control. That's the first time I ever had a realization of uh, that problem ensuing. Uh, of course, I, I didn't worry because like most uh, things that we had a team on the ground, uh, really a call of people around the country uh, to help work problems. Uh, so I was confident a lot of the best brain power would be brought uh, to bear to solve it. Uh, a statistic most people don't realize is the peak of the Apollo program 
which was actually probably about 1968 before we landed on the moon, uh, the total number of people working on Apollo across this country was over 400,000 people. Uh, and every state in the Union except one of the Dakotas, see the South and North Dakota, there were no employees working Apollo. And it attracted very good people uh, to, for the challenge. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of good brain power on the ground, I knew. Can you explain to us what the view from space was like? Uh, it's very difficult. I know there's a lot of people, and we probably need an artist. Uh, well, I guess we've had one with Al Bean. Uh, but an artist up there that can more uh, aptly uh, describe it. You know, I've heard sensational, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, and it's, it's one of the two things that, uh, from my background at least, as a fighter pilot, as a test pilot, I uh, was not prepared for, uh, was the view. Uh, I've seen pictures before I flew, uh, video, uh, not video, but 16 millimeter right. movie camera in those days, uh, before I, uh, I lifted off. But when you get there and you're looking out the window, either at the Earth orbit or obviously at the moon and distance from that distance looking at Earth, uh, as a little beautiful orb in the sky, or the moon close up uh, with its very uh, life, lifeless uh, landscape and very battered, it looks unreal. I mean, that's my terminology. It just, you can't believe you're there. You can't believe you're, what you're seeing is real. Like, am I really here looking at what I'm seeing? Uh, just to complete that story, the other unusual thing you can't prepare for, uh, except for very short intervals on uh, here, is zero gravity, mm -hmm. where you can free float or yourself or free float objects, uh, which is really kind of a euphoric experience and nice, really nice to have in a, a small confines of a spacecraft because you can use the whole space. Uh, it's all open, just as in this room we could use the ceiling as well as the floor. <laughs> Do you feel the Apollo 13 mission was a bigger test for the people on the ground or for the astronauts? Uh, I don't think you can distinguish the two. Uh, the uh, whole process of uh, space flight is a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, you cannot do, uh, you can't do one without the other. I mean, as far as being the people that are flying and the people on the ground in mission control. It's the total uh, mix of the two, that, and it's required uh, to execute a mission. And, the same, and that's whether you do it where other things, where things are going right, and certainly where things are not going right. I think Apollo 13 represented probably the uh, strongest test right. of the team uh, to handle the uh, myriad of problems that were faced in this mission and had to be worked out most by people on the ground. And as I said, not just uh, Houston. Uh, for instance, that lithium cartridge, uh, there were people involved at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, Grumman, the contractor uh, who built the lunar module, the landing craft. Mm -hmm. uh, they, in turn, called in Hamilton Standard in Connecticut, uh, who built the environmental system. Uh, so those kind of people, were experts, were called in for counseling. So there's a fairly large number of people brought to bear to deal with each of these problems. And they were thoroughly tested on the ground. In fact, that particular one with the lithium cartridge, uh, that, was, that, that was one was built mm -hmm. and tested in a vacuum chamber with human subjects to verify it would work before they passed that procedure <laughs> up to us. So those kind of things were handled that way with the team. Okay. Can you describe the strategies that allows you to come home safely? Uh, well, it'd, it'd be several uh, strategies without talking about the mission, uh, the new mission, if you will. Uh, the, the one thing that was done uh, by Gene Krantz, uh, Gene was the lead flight director uh, for this mission, and, was, and actually his white team <coughs> was on duty when this happened. Uh, Gene made, a, uh, my view, a very strategic position. He chose to take himself offline at that point. He turned it up, the next shift was Glenn Lunny. And there actually were four flight directors. Uh, Jerry Griffin was another one. Bill Wendler was the fourth. Well, Gene went offline and formed a brain trust. He picked key people, and they took over a room off to the side in mission control. And then from that room, they formulated kind of the new mission plan and the problems that had to be solved. And from that point, that brain trust called in 
the right people, if you will, a right person that they felt was given the ball to go work this problem. That person, that's the way it was worked. That person was told, here's the problem, here's what we need to know, and when we need to know it, like 36 hours from now, you can call anybody you want in the country and counsel with them to go work the problem. We want you back, though, in 36 hours with the answer. Right. And they normally gave, they wanted time away from when they really needed it so they could try it out in the simulator and have time to change it a little bit, work it over. So that was the way it was done. It was done offline with Gene running this brain trust. And it was obviously very effective in, in bringing to bear the right talent to go work the problems and get them done in a very short order. Uh, the mission itself obviously had the first keystone and just a new mission plan was to get back on the path that would get us back to Earth. Uh, the next critical thing was to get the LEM to a power down point, uh, limited power, to enable it to, be, to last four days versus the two days it was designed for. So that was the next critical thought process. Kind of uh, several others in the interval there was to figure out how to use the square lithium cartridges in the limb, uh, improvising that, uh, that thing. Uh, one of the most difficult uh, was for the ground, people on the ground, to figure out how to power up the command and service module. See, it was called the mothership, the mothership being because it was never supposed to be powered down in flight. Mother's always supposed to be there available for you. And so there was, there was no procedure on how to power it back up. It did not exist, except on launch pad before launch, which involved a lot of extra equipment and a lot of people. Okay. So there was no, no procedure existed on how to power up that vehicle. So they kind of had to start from scratch. And that was, that was a very, very difficult uh, process. The procedure was, was long. I mean, in fact, the problem we had when they read it up, we didn't have enough blank paper. We didn't have a spare book of blank paper, so we had to use the backs of books and the inside covers and things like that to have enough room to write this very long procedure down. Mr. Hayes, explain how the mid-course correction burn was done manually by orienting the spacecraft with the Earth's Terminator. All right. Uh, Procedure, uh, and incidentally, I'd, for those that have seen the Apollo 13 movie, uh, this was highly dramatized okay. uh, in the movie for effect. Uh, we did two of those maneuvers without the use of a computer. Uh, they were very short maneuvers, one using a decent engine, the one we would normally use to land on the moon, the other one using four jet RCS reaction control motors, 100, pound, 100 pounders each mm -hmm. on the limb. I think one uh, maneuver was 21 seconds long, uh, the other one was shorter, it was like 18 seconds. That's how long we had to run the engines. Uh, it turned out from those previous maneuvers we had done using the computer, the uh, gimbaled engine was pretty well steered right through the center of gravity of the vehicle. So it really didn't move much when we did those short burns. In fact, if we had not touched anything, I doubt if the vehicle would have moved more than five degrees. In a movie, it had it waving in the sky. <laughs> now, anyway, to get to the pointing, uh, what Jim Lovell did was he oriented using a little sight in this window uh, at the cusp of the Earth. We had a half Earth coming back. You've seen a half moon. Well, we had a ha half moon and a half Earth. And he, he lined the sight. Uh, along the cusp, they call it, the points mm -hmm. on the half Earth, and then pitched from that attitude while I looked through a periscope. It was called the uh, AOT, uh, Apollo Optical Telescope, and it actually points upward. And the upper part of that view is about 60 degrees up from out the front windows. So he pitched till I first picked up the sun. And when I could see the sun, I said, stop. And he stopped at that attitude, and that's how we fixed how to make the burn. Okay. How much of a disappointment was it not to walk on the moon and not command Apollo 13? Uh, right. Well, it was, it was a, a great disappointment for, I'll say, a short time after the flight. 
I did get reassigned as the backup on Apollo 16 as the commander. And at that time, I expected I would have flown Apollo 19. It was, at that point, the last mission of the program. Uh, that went away after four or five months when they canceled 18 and 19. Uh, but what changed my uh, sense of it uh, in a pretty short time was all the public affairs events. Uh, we were, of course, like typically after a flight, uh, you're the latest set of heroes, so you get to do all this media stuff around, in fact, around the world. And uh, when I saw the caring uh, people and the attention they'd given, uh, those are literally many, many places, prayer vigils that went on through the night, around the clock. Uh, and uh, like I said, all over this country and all over the world. Then I kind of felt a, a little selfish just because I was, you know, sorry and disappointed I had landed. Uh, you know, I really should be, bless God, I was back. And uh, of course, it's changed even more with the years that have gone by because I've also noted now there's not many people going back to the moon. And today I just feel very uh, privileged very lucky that I was born, literally born at the right time. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. and I ended up accidentally in the right profession because when I was young, you couldn't want to be an astronaut. There were none, except in serials, uh, Buck <laughs> Rogers and Flash Garden. Uh, so I accidentally ended up in flying because I hadn't planned to fly. Incidentally, I was going to be a journalist my first two years of college, and the Korean War changed that. So I became a pilot. I loved flying. I got into test flying. So I accidentally ended up in the right groove, uh, experience-wise, to apply and be accepted into the program, and today be one of 24 human beings that have had the chance to go to the moon. So like I said, I feel very, very fortunate. The Ron Howard movie, Apollo 13, was quite successful and has been called one of the best space movies ever made. How accurately do you think the actor Bill Paxton portrayed you? And overall, how accurately did it depict the entire mission? Uh, let me think about that. Bill, as far as I was concerned, Bill did a fine job. It really was not an epic story uh, like the story of Gandhi, where it was a story of uh, their life. It was really the story of uh, six days. And uh, as far as I was concerned, uh, he carried that off uh, fine. Uh, the movie, uh, about the only things I would have done differently, but of course I'm not a Hollywood movie director, is they did add uh, foul language, uh, some off-color language. Uh, that was not our lines. In fact, I was I frankly surprised after Splashdown uh, to help us write one chapter of the mission report. It's called the pilot report. We were given all the air-to-ground transmissions, everything that had been said by Mission Control or ourselves, and there was not a curse word. I mean, I, I, not that none of us had ever, <laughs> ever said a curse word, but we didn't during this flight. I was somewhat amazed, in fact, uh, because of circumstances. Uh, so that was kind of added into the movie, which gave it its PG-13 uh, rating. Uh, the other thing was the... Uh, I'll give a little flavor, I felt at least, of the treatment of Jack Schweigert replacing Ken Mattingly. The movie uh, gave you uh, kind of a flavor that we were concerned about could Jack do the job. And that was not the case at all. We trained as, uh, in those days, uh, totally as a prime and a backup crew equally. In fact, I, as I told you, I was a backup on three of the missions. If you looked at the flight records, the training records, as a backup, I felt better, equal if not better trained than the prime to go fly the mission. In fact, I, I probably had a few more training hours because the, the prime crew would get drug off to do a press conference. Uh, they worried about their guest list, who was coming, the design of the patch, those kind of things. On those days, when they were off doing those kind of things, the backup crew would be using the simulator training. So if you looked at training hours and preparation, a backup crew was just, mm. and that's the plan, that they, right. you literally could change out a crew uh, the day before. Now, we really did uh, a number of exercises in the simulator within those two days with Jack, more to make sure as we discussed things, we used the same language. We all used the same books, the checklist. 
So there was no question the procedures were common between the two crews, but we worried about how to express things, particularly with some of the emergencies or the coordination required, say, in a rendezvous. So we went through those exercises with Jack to make sure the backup crew had developed some different code, if you will, and how they discuss things. Some people say the Apollo 13 mission will go down in history as one of the, as one of the greatest accomplishments in manned spaceflight. Immediately after the mission, did you feel that it was a success or did you consider it a failure because you were unable to land on the moon? Uh, I'd have to say I considered it a failure. Uh, I, it's very much, uh, I tried to explain that too, obviously elated that I'm still able to now spoil grandchildren. Uh, but at the time, you're so geared to the mission. You're, it'd be, it, it, same way if, if uh, you had two excellent teams mm -hmm. get to the Super Bowl, and you say, that's a great accomplishment, just to get to the Super Bowl. But I still can't believe that the team that loses is going to feel bad. Right. They're going to be disappointed, even though there was a great accomplishment just to get there because you're geared to the mission and the success of what's planned and you've trained to do. So I guess it's a natural human reaction if you are if you really work that way toward a goal and you don't quite achieve that goal. Uh, as far as, again, the, uh, the mission has certainly shown what the capability of the total team was to handle and work problems. Uh, it probably has become somewhat of folklore from the standpoint of the uh, movie. Historically, though, if you could go ahead a uh, thousand years from now and look at a history book, I'm not sure you'd find Apollo 13. You'd likely find Apollo 8, the first time people left the Earth. Uh, certainly Apollo 11, the first time people landed. You might find Apollo 17 just listed as the end of the program. But, uh, that's if you went out a thousand years, what I expect you'd find. Thank you for being here with us, Mr. Hayes. We enjoyed you. Thank you. I'm your host, Logan Blackman. Until next time.